Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my reaction channel. My name is Teddy90, today we're going to be reacting to Crash Course World History Episode 2, The Indus River Valley Civilization. Now, I don't know much about the Indus River Valley Civilization. It's not an area that I have studied for any length of time. So, this may be even more rambly or even shorter than usual. I don't really know how this is going to play out. I'm going to aim for shorter than 40 minutes, which was the last one. But I make no promises. I'll say that. I make no promises. But, yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll just react to this. And if, yeah. Uh, if you like Crash Course, uh, like their video and stuff to this stuff and everything else like that. They deserve all the love and happiness and everything else in the world. I don't. I don't deserve it. They deserve it. I'm just some guy who's watching them. Now, let's just jump into it and see what they got for us. Hi, I'm John Green, and this is Crash Course World History. Let's begin today with a question. Why okay. am I alive? Also, why don't I have any eyes? Oh, that's better. Why am I alive? To be or not to be, that is the question. That I don't think there's any good answer to that. Well, obviously being alive, it's because we're not sure if there's anything that comes after this, and behaving as if anything comes after this is detrimental to ourselves in this life. And if there is something, or if there is nothing that comes after this, and we lived our life in accordance to there is something coming after this, then what was the point of it? Or if we lived our life in accordance there is something coming after this and there is something coming after this and we were only purposely acting in one way we never actually lived in this life perhaps not living in this life would be the boundary for us not being able to get into the next life if that makes sense Anyway, that's a religious and philosophical discussion. The way we answer that question ends up organizing all kinds of other thoughts, like what we should value and how we should behave and if we should eat meat and whether we should dump that boy who is very nice but insanely clingy in a way that he cannot possibly think is attractive. All of which- Mr. Has... Green, Mr. Green, uh, are, are, are you talking about me? Yes, I am talking about you, me from the past. I am telling you that one of the reasons we study history is so that you can be a less terrible boyfriend, but more on that momentarily. <laughs> I have definitely been a terrible boyfriend in the past. As I'm sure most people have been terrible relationship partners in the past as well. It's a human thing. You learn, you grow, and you're terrible to your first re first few relationship partners. At least I was. Today we're going to talk about civilizations, but in order to do that, we have to talk about talking about civilizations, mm -hmm. because it's a problematic word. So problematic, in fact, that I have to turn to camera two to discuss it. Certain conglomerations of humans are seen as civilizations, whereas, say, nomadic cultures generally aren't. Unless you are, say it with me, the Mongols. The Huns were a civilization. That's not strictly speaking true. He's going to get into it more after this, probably, but that's not strictly speaking true. But if you want to civilized in my opinion is primarily settled and with a writing system primarily settled complex building uh, building structures and writing system those are the three things that make a civilized society in my mind but he'll get it into more of this later and you know my opinion from the previous video by calling some group civilizations you imply that all other social orders are uncivilized which is basically just another way of saying that they're savages or barbarians side note originally greek the word barbarian denoted anyone who did not speak ancient greek because mm -hmm. to the greeks all other languages sounded like bar 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 so that is to say that we are all essentially barbarians except for the classics majors which is worth remembering when we're discussing civilizations civilization <laughs> Everyone but classics majors are barbarians. You know, I can see it. I can 100% see it. So like most of the things we like to study, they're intellectual constructs. No one woke up in the city of Thebes in Egypt one morning and said, what a beautiful morning. I sure am living at the height of Egyptian civilization. Still, they're useful constructs, particularly when you're comparing one civilization. True. You never really know what time you're living in. Granted, it's easier to know that you're living in the worst timeline than it is in comparison to knowing when you're living in the like the height of something it's a lot easier to notice when you're in in when you're in the low of something you you notice when you're in the low but you don't really notice when you're in the high like people living through the fall of rome they knew they were living through the fall of rome when barbarians were sacking a rome and taking it over things like that 
barbarians. I just fell into that trap. Well, they were barbarians. Let's be real. They were barbarians. They had their own culture and things like that, but they were barbarians in comparison to the Romans. Not that the Romans weren't barbaric in their own ways, but you, you know what I mean. Like, the Germanic tribes taking over. Like, they... The Romans knew that they were they were in the worst time of being a Roman. Because it's easier to notice when things have gone all the way to hell than it is to notice when the things are great. ...to another. They're less useful when you're comparing a civilization to a non-civilization type social order, mm -hmm. which is why we will try to avoid that. And yes, I am getting to the good boyfriend stuff. Patience, grasshopper. So what is a civilization? Well, diagnosing a civilization is a little like diagnosing an illness. If you have four or more of the following symptoms, you might be a civilization. Surplus production. Once one person mm -hmm. can make enough food to feed several people, it becomes... Okay, possible that is to build a this. city, another symptom of civilization. It also leads to the special. This is a pocket knife, by the way. It's just like a typical. Civilization of labor, which in turn leads to trade. Like if everybody picks berries for a living, there is no reason to trade because I have berries and you have berries. But if I pick berries for a living and you make hammers, suddenly we have cause to trade. Civilizations are also usually associated with social stratification, centralized government, shared values, generally in the form of religion and writing. And at least in the early days, they were almost always associated with rivers. These days, you can just bisect a segment of land horizontally and vertically and boom, build a city. But 5,000 years ago, civilizations were almost always always associated with rivers, whether that's the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Yellow River, the Nile, the Amazon Basin, the Coatzacoalcos. God, I was doing so good until I got to Coatzacoalcos. Coatzacoalcos. Coatzacoalcos, maybe. Why River Valley? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, river, river Valleys have a tendency to do it. Um, there are some that probably should have developed civilizations along the way. The Mississippi is a great example of one that definitely could have held a... Uh, big civilization but again north america was screwed over by its complete and utter lack of any domesticatable animals uh, the, the, nor, no, the north american natives got screwed or north and south american natives got screwed just completely and utterly from just just from every direction they got screwed <laughs> They're flat, they're well watered, and when they flood, they deposit nutrient rich silt. We'll have more to say about most of these civilizations later, but let's talk about this guy, the Indus Valley civilization, because it's my all time favorite. And it fell, and no one really knows how or why it fell, and no one really knows much about it. But it was interesting. I know where the Indus Rivers of Valley, I know there are some cities in the Indus River Valley civilization that were incredibly peaceful, didn't really have much of an army. And that's one of the big reasons people thought they fell, because they just didn't have much of a standing army. Favorite. The Indus Valley civilization was located in the floodplain of the Indus and Sawardi rivers, and it was about mm -hmm. the best place in the world to have an ancient civilization because the rivers flooded very reliably twice a year, which meant that it had the most available calories per acre of pretty much anywhere on the planet. We know the Indus Valley civilization flourished a long time ago, probably around 3000 BCE. Why is that question literally hanging over my head? But people of the Indus Valley <laughs> were trading with Mesopotamians as early as 3500 BCE. We also know that it was the largest of the ancient civilizations. Archaeologists have discovered more than... And you can see how Persia came about here, right? Uh, or like why there would be like a big empire right here because... Or why there's like different like trading kingdoms and why Arabia was so in, into... Merch mercantile things it's because in between these two river basins you can see this persia and the middle east were right in between the trade routes particularly here so of course or iran rather iran would become like the crossroads and the walkway so of course civilizations would pop up and become the middlemen here and then it made sense for them all to join into one as people cross the path here and they would make a lot of money from being the middlemen between India and the Middle East. A lot of money is to be made there. And then there's also reasons why this area here, the the Middle East, became very, very or the Arabs became well-known traders. Because they would take boats and go down to India or over here and then sail them up through here or sail, bring them up through here. It was... They, these two groups were the middlemen for a very long time in history. 1500 sites. So what do we know about this civilization? Let's go to the thought bubble. Everything we know about the Indus Valley civilization comes from archaeology because while they did use written language, we don't- At least until the Persians conquered everything. 
don't know how to read it, and no Rosetta Stone has thus far appeared to help us learn it. I meant the other Rosetta Stone thought bubble. Yeah, although come to think <laughs> of it, Rosetta either Stone. would be acceptable. So yeah. here's what we know. They had amazing cities. Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are the best known, with dense, multi-story homes constructed mm -hmm. out of uniformly sized bricks along perpendicular streets. I mean, this wasn't some ancient world version of Houston, more like Chicago. This means they must have had some form of government and zoning, but we don't know what gave this government its authority. Cities were oriented to catch the wind and provide a natural form of air conditioning. And they were clean. Most homes were connected to a centralized drainage system that used gravity to carry waste and water out of... Yeah, the Indus River Valley civilization was insanely developed. It was insanely developed. Like, the, like sewers and things like that only came about much later in other civilizations. Like... It, it's crazy. The city in big sewer ditches that ran under the main avenues, a plumbing mm -hmm. system that would have been the envy of many 18th century European cities. Also, in Mahendradaro, the largest public building was not a temple or a palace, but a public bath, bath. which historians yep. call the Great Bath. We don't know. <laughs> historians aren't good at naming things. What the Great Bath was. You just give it to the people in marketing. Used for, but since later Indian culture placed a huge emphasis on ritual purity, which is the basis for the caste system, some historians have speculated that the bath might have been like a giant baptismal. Pool. Also, they traded. One of the coolest things. Or it was just a bath. It, the, the simple. There's always this tendency in historians to be like, oh, but this thing is this, or this thing like has a deeper meaning. And it's like, no. Sometimes it's Occam's Raised for my dudes. It is just the simplest thing is the simplest thing. Maybe the giant bathhouse was legitimately a bathhouse. Right? Like. Sometimes the simplest answer is the best answer. Maybe the big bathhouse is a big bathhouse. That the Indus Valley civilization produced were seals used as identification markers on goods and clay tablets. These seals contain the writing that we still can't decipher and a number of fantastic designs, many featuring animals and monsters. One of the most famous and frightening is of a man with what looks like water buffalo horns on his head, sitting cross-legged between a tiger and a bull. We don't know what's really going on here, but it's safe to say that this was a powerful dude because he seems to be able to control the tiger. How did these seals let us know that they traded? Well, because we found them in Mesopotamia, not the Indus Valley. Plus, archaeologists have found stuff like bronze in the Indus Valley that is not native to the region. So what did they trade? Cotton cloth. Still such a fascinating export, incidentally, that it will be the subject of the 40th and final video in this very series. But here's the most amazing thing about the Indus Valley people. Cotton cloth was always needed. Um, runner stand. The in Europe, the low regions, which is Belgium and the Netherlands today, the, the, I did not get that. Those naming, uh, name. I can't speak today, but yeah, that that area where the Belgium and the Netherlands are today was incredibly famous for making high quality cloths, and that's how they uh, became very very rich and ended up developing uh, a good merchant and business class. Not only because the Spanish and then the Habsburgs were absentee land uh, landowners, but also because they just that they just ended up becoming able they had really good uh cotton supplies or sheep and things like that they were able to make really really nice cloth and cloth was always something that ended up getting traded everywhere because everyone needs clothes they were that's also why when the cotton gin was created it slavery became a much bigger thing in the americas because the cotton gin made it mo so much easier to pick cotton it was peaceful. Despite arch well, wool and cotton. archaeologists finding 1,500 sites, they have found very little evidence of... Yeah, because it was the Belgians and the Netherlands didn't have cotton. They had sheep. But North America had cotton. No, India had cotton. They brought cotton over to India, I think. What? No. Yeah? What? No. I confused myself. Doesn't matter. Warfare Let's move on. And almost no weapons. Thanks, thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a peaceful society. Okay, before we talk about the fascinating demon. Sorry, I confused myself, and now, yeah, okay. Eyes mm -hmm. of the Indus Valley civilization. It's time for the open letter. Magic. Smooth. I wonder what the secret compartment has for me today. Oh, fancy clothes. Mm -hmm. I guess the secret compartment didn't think I was dressed up enough for the occasion. An open letter to historians. Dear historians, the Great Bath? Really? 
The Great Bath? I'm trying to make history fascinating, and you give me a term that evokes scented candles, bath salts, and Frederick Fakai hair products? I know sometimes the crushingly boring names of history aren't your fault. You didn't name the Federalist Papers or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or Adam Smith, but when you do get a chance to name something, <laughs> you go Smith. with... The Great Bath? Not the epic bath of Mohenjo-Daro, or the bath to end all baths, or the pool that ruled, or the moist mystery of Mohenjo-Daro, or the wet wonder? The Great Bath? Really? You can do better. Best wishes, John Green. So what happened to these people? True. Historians are very bad at naming things. Again. Should give it a mark. Well, me. here's what didn't happen to them. They didn't morph into the current residents of that area of the world, Hindu, Indians, or Muslim Pakistanis. Those people probably came from the Caucasus. Instead, mm -hmm. sometime around 1750 BCE, the Indus Valley civilization declined until it faded into obscurity. Why? Historians have three theories. One, conquest. Turns out to be a terrible military strategy not to have any weapons, and it's possible people from the Indus Valley were completely overrun by people from the Caucasus. Two, environmental disaster. It's possible they brought about their own end by destroying their environment. Three, earthquake. The most interesting theory is that a massive earthquake- Honestly, it was probably all three of those. Like with their uh, Bronze Age collapse, people were like, it could have been a volcano going off, it could have been a massive droughts, it could have been people migrating in from other places and it's it's likely all three it's kind of like the fall of the roman empire you can't really point to one thing that really made it fall there's just like a bunch of things happening all at once and it was just too much to handle all at once so it just collapsed you can't be like that is what caused it it's more like all of that caused it like it if you removed half of it they might have been able to stay around but it you just it just fell. You just, you, it was too much. Changed the course of the rivers so much that a lot of the tributaries dried up. Without adequate water supplies for irrigation, the cities couldn't sustain themselves, so people literally just picked up and left for greener pastures. Well, probably not pastures. It's unlikely they became nomads. They probably just moved to a different plane and continued their agricultural ways. I am already boring you, and I haven't even told you yet how to be a better boy and or girlfriend. I'm gonna do that now. So we don't know why the Indus Valley civilization ended, but we also don't really know why it started. Why did these people build cities and dig swimming pools and make unnecessarily ornate seals? Were they motivated by hunger, fear, a desire for companionship, the need to be near their sacred spaces, or a general feeling that city life was just more awesome than foraging? Thinking about what motivated them to structure- City life is more awesome than foraging. Structure their life as they did helps us to think about how we structure our own lives. In short, you're clingy because you're motivated by fear and a need for companionship. And she finds it annoying because it's enough work having to be responsible for herself without having to also be responsible for you. Also, you're not really helping her by clinging, and from the Indus Valley in the Bronze Age to school life today, human life is all about collaboration. Trading cloth for bronze, building cities together, and collaborating to make sure that human lives are tilted to catch the wind. Next week, we will travel here to discuss the hot mess Opatamia. But in the meantime, <laughs> if you have any questions, leave them in comments, and our team of semi-trained semi-professionals will do their best to answer them. Also, you'll find some suggested resources in the video info below, he said, pointing at his pants. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Today's episode of Crash Course was produced and directed by Stan Muller. That was a good video. 10 out of 10. That was a good video. Do, 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 do. I think this is just a credit. So the show so was written them, by my high school history. I'll let them roll and myself, in the background. Our graphics team is that was a good one. And our script supervisor is Danica Johnson. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the in this river rally civilization by any stretch of the imagination. But it is fascinating how much more advanced than some of their neighbors they were. It, re it really is fascinating just how much more advanced they were. Wow, I'm tired. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, gonna end this here before I pass out. Alright, if you enjoyed this video, uh, well, before I say that, go sub to Crash Course, go like the video, all that other stuff. They deserve everything, I deserve nothing. But if you liked my honestly kind of half-hearted ramblings, uh, then give me a like, give me a sub, go join my Twitch, go join my Discord, all that other good stuff. If you have any dislikes with this video, please leave them in comments. I'd rather have comments than just a pile of dislikes. That's me personally. I'd rather know what I'm doing wrong so I can potentially change it. Uh, I'm not... I'm gonna say I'm not really good at that, considering the last video was 40 minutes long, and one of the main comments on one of my other videos of the negatives was, Yo, dude. 
uh, stop pausing so much, stop talking so much. Uh, oops, that's I guess that's not happening. But apart from that, uh, leave it in the comments and everything else like that. Uh, I love your faces. I'll see you in the next one. Love, butts, and happiness, and all that other good stuff. And goodbye, my gravy babies.